All right, thanks a lot, everyone. And um, I look forward to hearing more from everyone about any thoughts you have on this work. So one thing I tell everyone before I talk is I'm originally from the Caribbean, from Trinidad and Tobago. And I have to tell you because people say they missed the first part of my talk trying to guess where I'm from. So now that you have solved that mystery and you know I'm from Trinidad, I guess I have your full attention. So one thing I also want to say is I'm, I'm new here. I only started two weeks ago and I'm in as general C involved me in all of this. And so I'm very open to um, hearing from people about um, you know, Min and I are putting a post off through all you know, Do you have suggestions for how we advertise this or recruit people who want to work on issues like this? Um, it's Min's post off that you generally see has been sharing with me. Do you have ideas for collaboration of people I should speak to on campus? And how do I sort of recruit students? You know, starting here, should we be advertising in you know, places like India, China? Are like Europeans really open to coming to Singapore? So I'm very open to suggestions and interest in collaboration. And the theme of my talk is really going to be about how do we actually use randomized experiments or randomized AB comparisons as a way to bring together instructors with social behavioral scientists and then machine learning researchers? So I think we're all aware that digital resources are increasingly being used, whether it's K-12 online homework, like Khan Academy on six months, um, on-campus courses, like Candace or Ivy League, or MOOCs. And I'm especially interested um, in using these resources to do experiments. And here's an example of what I'm going to talk about today. How do we take something simple and it's almost boring, a digital problem, and how do we really supercharge people's learning from that? For example, there are many professors, imagine Joe teaching statistics, where he's giving students problems, but they're not always learning from them. They might not get the key concepts. And problems are not as simple as they look. You can even have problems in context like trying to teach people how to behave with therapy. For example, helping people reflect on situations that might be causing depression and help them um, learn to manage it. And that's another topic I've worked on in the past. But we all know that these resources need to be improved. Even when they're really designed, I feel like you can't really figure out what's going to work and help people learn unless it's deployed in the real world. So I think we need to figure out how do we deploy resources so that they're more like real teachers? How can I build software so that it perpetually improves? For example, with problems. Right now, you might get the same explanation over and over again in an on-campus course or on Khan Academy. But none of you would look a thousand students in the eye and explain the same thing over and over again. You naturally vary your explanations over time. And because you're varying how you explain, you'd eventually learn which explanations are better than others. But you'd also learn how do you personalize these explanations? Which ones work for students with different levels of knowledge or different, different reading abilities? So my kind of ultimate goal is to think of how do we deploy systems that can perpetually improve the same way real teachers do. And I actually see digital resources as being unique allowing this because digital resources allow us to do randomized experiments on a scale and in new ways we couldn't do before. When a student moves from pen and paper to doing problems online, that actually is revolutionary. It means that we've now got a setting that combines a researcher's lab where you can do controlled experiments with a real world class. I see experiments as actually being a bridge between teachers who might be asking questions about you know, which motivation messages work, social behavioral scientists who ask questions like, um, what are different cognitive processes that people engage in or what are the attitudes that they form, and then actually machine learning researchers. In particular, I think a lot about reinforcement learning, which is machine learning for deciding how do you take actions. So can we run our randomized experiments so that we have algorithms that will in real time figure out which conditions are, are good and can we deploy them to future students? and which conditions work for different people. And so my approach to kind of building these uh, perpetually improving systems is not in any way to replace teachers or scientists, it's actually to bring these all together. And so my approach is to think, how do we really reimagine experiments so that they're collaborative, dynamic, and personalized? So to tackle a challenge like education, my perspective is that whenever I'm looking to design an experiment, formulating the experiments on messages, on prompts for people to reflect on explanations. I joined my cognitive science PhD, where I mostly focus on lab studies, really trying to figure out processes underlying learning. But I think I really need the kind of perspective that, for example, our NIE speakers bring. And so my postdoc, I focus a lot on education and instructional design. If I want to turn experiments into actually helping learners, though, we need to be able to dynamically analyze data. So how can we actually start off experimenting with equal probability? But as we figure out that one explanation seems to be helping students learn more, then that's actually changes dynamically. So we might say start analyzing data after the first 10 students, first 20, first 30, and change it so now we're presenting explanations 
60-40, 80-20. And so what that means is that we eventually end up with tuning any experiment into an enhancement is actually just a better product where everyone gets a good explanation. But we can do better than that, right? Like Dragon said this morning, if we go beyond one size fits all, we can actually use randomized experiments to figure out how do we personalize in the sense of delivering maybe simple explanations to people with lower reading levels and more complex people with time. So to do that, what I do is I draw on Bayesian statistics and reinforcement learning. So in my PhD, I apply these methods to modeling psychology. But now I actually apply them to building systems that will improve in real time. Some of you are probably thinking, well, if you just run an experiment without any input for innovation, you can only get so far. And so I think a key part of the dynamic ability is that I build software that lets you keep adding new conditions. So you might deploy an experiment in a teacher's class, but they have a new idea. So let's figure out methods where you can keep adding these conditions in real time so that we actually never stop experimenting. We're always coming up with new ways to improve. And to do that, I draw a lot on methods from crowdsourcing and human computation. Now, finally, to kind of bind all this together, what I found is that I've collaborated with platforms like Khan Academy, like edX, Coursera. The best of them do not let you do this. Even if they allow randomized experiments, which are actually rare, they don't allow you to keep adding new conditions. They don't allow instructors to collaborate with researchers. So I've actually developed um, what I call Mooplex. It's a software requirement specification. So anytime you want to run a randomized experiment, anytime you want to do a personalization activity, this is something you can use. And it basically lets you do something simple. Let's do a randomized experiment. Let's do an adaptivity algorithm. But it gives you data structures and APIs. So at any point in time, you can start doing all of this. Keep adding conditions, changing the experiment to personalize it. And all these studies represent a basically back by this engine. So give me an overview. I started this vision of how do we kind of move towards professional improvement systems. But I want these professional improved not just through AI, but actually by bringing together the wisdom of instructors with scientists and with machine learning researchers. And so my approach is to really think about rethink experiments to be collaborative, dynamic, and personalized. So I'm going to present very quickly. Um, I basically condensed the 60 minute talk into 20, 25 minutes. So I'll just go over very quickly so you can see it. Two examples of experiments on showing people motivation messages on Khan Academy and prompting people to explain why they were solving problems. I'll present one example of a system that basically crowdsources explanations from learners and uses reinforcement learning to figure out which ones learners find helpful. Then another system that I built and deployed with three instructors at Harvard that I'm actually not moving out ideally, and I would love to put that in case for context as well, that lets teachers work with researchers to co-design experiments. And then I'll give one example of an illustration of the future, which is how we can use these experiments to discover how to personalize. And I'll turn to some ongoing and next direction. So if you're interested in thinking about collaboration, or if you have suggestions for who I should talk to, both in higher education and in the K-12 context, or even in other settings, um, I'm thinking about building systems and conducting research to personalize motivation emails. How do we deliver interventions that can prove it to work in a more integrated way? Where, for example, we might think of delivering growth mindset interventions versus metacognitive strategy training and figure out who's going to benefit with most of, from these at different times. For example, to freshmen at NUS or to high school and uh, non primary school students. So I should say secondary school. So I'm from Trinidad, so I use all the vocabulary saying for it's used. Primary school, secondary school, I said slightly saying A levels. But I've been in the US for 14 years, so now I have to relearn all of my vocabulary. <laughs> okay. And something I'm also working on is a web app that will help students set micro goals. And in particular, a web app that helps people adopt reflective questioning strategies. So in the spirit of like teaching students metacognition in the context of what they're reading online or what problems they're solving. Okay, so just take the first step. So what I'm going to describe here are two kinds of experiments on math problems. And I'm interested in many of the applications, but I think this gives a good intro. The first is looking at motivation messages, and the second is looking at asking people questions that will help them reflect. And this was funded by an NSF grant that I, I got of Neil Heffernan, which basically was all about um, bringing experiments out of the lab into the real world. And so this is the first online experiment I ever ran, actually, in collaboration with Khan Academy. And so I worked with them to think, what's the simplest change we could make that might actually move the needle? Because there were a lot of technical restrictions. And I have to do this programming myself. So what I propose is to collaborate with a group at Stanford from Carol Dweck's um, research, where we design motivational messages that 
towards students a growth mindset. The idea that your intelligence can actually be changed through effort. For example, remember, the more you practice, the smarter you become. So we decided to just roll this out and compare growth mindset message to nothing at all. But one condition I, I argue for is to also include a positive or encouraging message. For example, some of these prompts are hard, do your best. And so it's very subtle. They both are positive, but the growth mindset message is drawing on, on this theory that it's really about telling people that uh, if they believe intelligence is malleable, then they will more like to work harder and try and seek out effective strategies. So what was the effect of these? when most students probably didn't even look at that message. So what we found is there was a pretty small but significant increase where growth mindset messages helped more than no messages, even though many students might not have read them. But what's interesting is these encouraging messages, they had no effect at all. When we asked people to read their predicted growth mindset encouraging messages would be equally effective, but in fact, it was like showing nothing at all. So this is a pretty small effect. And not surprisingly, because it's a small change and most people didn't take it seriously, but it actually had an outsized impact. Because Khan Academy then spontaneously decided, based on having seen the experiment of their platform, to deploy a campaign where they send millions of learners videos and emails, really teaching them this idea of growth mindset, that you can learn anything. And they had a competition by three researchers to do similar kinds of experiments. So here's another example where I'm really trying to see, can we actually increase learning gains by getting more the cognitive processes that underlie people's thinking? And so the key idea here is to prompt people to explain why they're solving problems. And in fact, I'm not presenting all this psychology research in my dissertation, but we developed a new theory of why explaining is helpful. So we all believe that prompting someone is helpful, but when is it helpful? Why is it helpful? When is it too much? And so our kind of key idea there was that prompting people to explain forces them to think about what they're explaining as an instance of a pattern. So for example, if someone's seeing a math problem, then like this one, you give her something about statistics and you ask to say which students run time. And the key thing you need to learn here is that ranking people from different populations isn't just based on their raw scores, it's actually based on some concept of standardization. So if we prompt someone to explain why the answer is correct, we hypothesize and we then see how that answer is just an instance of a broader pattern, that you need to use standard deviation comparing populations. In our control condition, we ask people to write their thoughts. Again, something that teachers expect would be very effective. Often we ask people to write their thoughts about answers or to justify their reasoning. But even though these are subtly very different and most people predict they're comparable, the first one is really based on this theory that explaining why they'll make people find online patterns. And so in this experiment, students would see about six of these problems, and they'd be randomized to get an explain prompt or write thoughts prompt. We measure learning by commencing a pre-test and a post-test to see how does actually explaining or writing your thoughts increase your ability to learn to read a post. With accuracy increase on the vertical axis, what we see here is that explaining led to significantly more learning than writing thoughts. Students said that it really helped them understand the logic, so they're able to solve more similar problems. And the key mechanism behind this is that explaining is forcing people to look at online patterns. So it's forcing them to discard the misconceptions they have and actually revise their beliefs. These are two insights into maybe more traditional experiments. How do you increase motivation? How do you get people to reflect so they find patterns? But I really was pushing this vision of how do we keep adding new conditions to an experiment? And how do we actually dynamically analyze data so we can improve what future students get based on the response of the previous students? For that context, I'm going to look at how we met through experiments on the explanations we give students for how to solve a problem. So this is the adaptive explanation improvement system. And the takeaway here is we crowdsource explanations from learners, run an experiment to figure out which explanations the learners rate as helpful, and then we show that that can actually improve learning as much as explanations written by an instructor. So the context here is that we need different explanations to test out, but instructors hardly have time to write one explanation. Where are we going to get others from? And so the idea actually comes from that previous paper. What if we tell learners that they should explain because it's helping them, 
then the explanations they generate can be given to others. So we can keep adding new conditions as an organic byproduct of what learners are doing. But then we need to have a method for figuring out which of these explanations are actually useful. And that's where dynamic analysis comes in. So the system I built actually used K-12 problems. Um, they came from the systems platform on probability and geometry. But you'd be surprised how bad um, adults online are at K-12 problems. So this is the way I actually ran the study. They'd see a problem and be told the correct answer. Then we give them an explanation for why the answer is correct. And that came from the existing pool. We'd ask them to rate how helpful was that explanation for their learning on a scale from 0 to 10. We then prompt them to help you learn, explain in your own words why this answer is correct. If the explanation was above 50 characters and they indicated it might be helpful to other people, we added to our pool. So to run this dynamic experiment, how do we frame this problem computationally? And I think of it as what's called a multi arm bandit in reinforcement learning, where the key idea here is that you have a set of actions you want to take. In this case, the explanations. And what you want to do is you want to optimize a reward. In this case, we chose the reward, what we want to optimize, as ratings of how helpful explanations are. Of course, we really want to optimize student learning. But when I, I applied the algorithm to looking at next problem correct, that actually wasn't as effective as looking at ratings because there's a lot of noise in that. And whether you get the next problem correct doesn't just depend on explanation fault. But I'll come back to measuring learning later. So we need an algorithm that provides a policy. For student 5, student 10, which explanation do we assign to them? And the policy I use here, you can think of as randomized, uh, weighted randomization that's being updated. It's called Thompson sampling. And the key idea here is that it's basically, you can understand it as a weighted probability distribution over explanations. 50%, 65, 20, and that's to be updated. So the key idea behind Thompson sampling is that the probability of assigning someone to an explanation or relating to any experimental condition is the probability that that's the best explanation. How do you compute what's the best explanation or what's our proxy? In this case, we need a model. And I won't go into details here, but basically the model we use here is a beta binomial and to use Bayesian statistics. And the probability of an explanation being rated helpful is modeled by a beta distribution. And we use priors that you can think of as saying, before we see any data, let's imagine that each explanation was rated a 9 and a 10. So we think it's good, a 9.5 or a 10, but actually we don't have much evidence for that. And then every time a student rates an explanation, we're using, with modeling that as being drawn from binomial distribution with 10 samples, with the probability of success is drawn from that beta distribution. It is the probability that that explanation will be rated helpful. And so we can then use beta Bayesian inference over this beta binomial model. So that intuitively you can think every time someone rates an explanation, like given 8 out of 10, it's as if they said, here's 8 thumbs up and 2 thumbs down. Then someone gives an explanation a 6 out of 10. It's like 6 thumbs up and 4 thumbs down. So while an experiment's running, we're constantly re-estimating these parameters. We're re-estimating a model of how high that rating is and how confident we are that that's actually the rating. This is where, where we use Bayesian inference. And this is um, a very efficient as well. You know, this, I actually implement this in JavaScript code running in a browser. So in terms of deployment, at first, we deployed this with just 150 people recruited online. And I chose that number because I wanted to work for either a university class, which could be a lecture of all the size, or maybe, a, let me do the conversion, a form four class that basically has two sections. So there might be 30 students in each. And if you offer this over two years, you might actually get up to 150 people. So I want a method that's going to work even for relatively small samples. At first, there's no explanations. People are just being prompted to explain. And then over time, explanations are being added, and you're going to update the problem distribution dynamically so that you can see the probability of assigning people conditions is changing based on what people are rating. And what you end up with at the end is a probability distribution over explanations. It's not all centered on one. It's actually a case that there are a couple of explanations that get high ratings and some that get very low. Do these explanations actually help learning? To do that, we took the explanations from those 150 people rating, 
and we deploy them in a separate study. And so we again administer a pretest of what people knew. Then we gave them the problems on their own in one condition. We had a separate condition where they got the problems with the explanations from access. And then we had a post test. So how much does adding those explanations in help people increase their ability to solve problems from pre to post? We included two other conditions. One was filtered explanations. So these are explanations from our system. Access is the adaptive explanation improvement system. These are explanations that got low probability. And finally, we compared it to explanations from an actual instructor. So here is the accuracy increase from pre to post. So what do we see there? Actually, access to explanations help learners significantly more than no explanations at all, even though these come from other learners and may run this dynamic algorithm over there. If you're a skeptic, you would say, well, any explanation would help. Actually, giving those explanations that were filtered out that the system assigned low probability was like giving no explanation at all. How good would this have to be compared to a real instructor for you to find this useful? 20%, 50%? In this application, there wasn't a significant difference in learning from explanations that were pulled from the learners and tested out through access and explanations written by the instructor themselves. The kind of key contributions here, how do we crowdsource from learners while they're learning? In a way, it's actually helping them. And let's use dynamic experimentation to put data into practice. We can keep adding new experimental conditions and then figure out which ones are working and help future learners. So there are many limitations of future directions, such as how do we involve teachers in the loop here? How do we apply NLP methods, like what Min and Carol will do? And can we generalize this to richer scenarios, like asking students to answer questions, and then taking those question answer pairs into a discussion forum? So I'm just going to very briefly show you this work, which is um, something I'm trying to deploy here on NUS Canvas, as well as in a K-12 setting. And so this is a CDE problem. It's a tool for co-designing experiments between instructors and researchers. And so the key idea here is that we can get teachers and social behavioral scientists coming together, but we need to help them have a very concrete question to discuss. And we also want to balance the teacher's desire to give everyone the best thing with the researcher's desire to randomize equally, which guarantees power. How do you think we can manage that? So the key idea is, again, applying the same algorithms I mentioned before for dynamic experimentation. So if you go to this URL, you can actually use the app. You can plug into a course or um, by LTI. And here's an example of how to use Interact. They would solve a problem, and again, they might get an explanation. And in this case, with three half instructors, we co design this problem in about an hour or two. For example, one setting, we give the instructor written a competition explanation of how students could understand statistical power, and then they wrote an analogical one, how statistical power is like a telescope. And there's an interface here where the instructor does not have to do anything besides go into the course and see the problem, and then actually start adding experimental conditions, adding different explanations. So it's really a very focused kind of experiment, and it's not possible in Canvas or ideally or Moodle right now. So here's just some sample data. By the end of the instructor running this study, the analogical explanation was being assigned to 77% of people. Well, what does that mean? It's actually because that was rated higher. Not so much higher that we're totally sure it's right, but there was a trend in that direction. I also asked instructors to rate ahead of time what they predicted would be effective. And what you can actually see is they predicted the opposite, that there would be no effect at all. So the kind of key insights from this, in terms of quality of instructor feedback, is that they did find it lower barriers. They just want to know how they would even start running these experiments before. It helped them reflect on pedagogy. Even if we don't get any significant data, it would have been a benefit in my mind that I thought about writing these different versions out. They also felt they made research practical. They appreciated collaborating with me as a researcher because you must know plenty of general things about how students learn. But then it was beneficial to me to work with them because they know very specific things about how students get calculus. And many details in the context that I can't really see coming from a lab setting or even coming from a lot of experience in higher ed to move into K 12. And finally, they liked that this actually made experiments practical. It's not a research tool. Students aren't guinea pigs. The point of experimenting is to figure out what's going to help students. Because earlier students get data that helps later students. 
So just to give you one illustration of how understanding these experiments is discover how to post lives, we send people messages um, in a course where a brief message, which is one of the they had in active recently. And then when we analyze the data in terms of response rates, it looked at first like there was no effect. So at this point, you can pop up and go home, right? Actually, once you start breaking up data and collecting the right measures, there was a crossover interaction where low activity learners are benefiting more from brief message, whereas people with higher activity are benefiting more from the second message. And if you actually use that data so that we could use the same infrastructure, the mobile that I mentioned, to personalize, well, we'd start from the experiment, and then over time, we dynamically switch to giving low activity people message one, high activity message two. This increased response rates by 14%. It's just an illustration, but I think this is just the beginning of how we can use these kinds of experiments to bring together instruction researchers to discover how we can personalize. And we can really rethink experiments as an engine for constantly improving personalizing. Okay. So I kind of mentioned those ongoing next directions, which I'm really excited to discuss with people. Personalizing motivational emails, delivery of different interventions that have been shown to work, but how we brought together and how we brought to a Singaporean context. Thinking about how do we personalize web apps that help students set micro goals, like what they do the next day or week. And then how do we actually get students in the habit of using reflective question strategies? Just to summarize, I started this vision of building perpetually improving systems. I might approach is collaborative, dynamic, personalized experimentation. I give an example of a study in Khan Academy with most mindset messages, and one that prompted people to reflect. This then led to building a system which would crowdsource explanations from learners while they were explaining for their own purposes, run a dynamic experiment to see which ones are highly rated. And this helped learners, uh, future learners as much as the explanations from the instructor themselves. The next phase is thinking about tools that will help teachers bring their wisdom into collaborations of designing experiments with instructors, and using this type of infrastructure to actually dynamically personalize by discovering empirically what's going to work for different subgroups of people. These are just a few examples that I'm going to put. So thanks a lot.